Okay, I think we could start. Um, my name is Lissa Harris and I'm the Executive Director of Strolling of the Heifers and welcome to day two of our first ever virtual Slow Living Summit. Um, we, today we have a very special guest, uh, Tom Newmar from New Chapter. Um, and he's going to speak in a little while. Um, we, uh, this is his presentation that you're seeing on the screen, and we wanted to make sure that it was up and we didn't have any issues um, for today's talk because it's going to be fantastic. And I want to introduce um, Jen Brandt, who has been the Slow Living Summit coordinator, um, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about what Tom's going to be talking about today. Yeah, thank you so much, Lissa. Um, Tom came to us from the Carbon Underground. Um, his daughter is a friend of the Stroll. Um, she is a local to Brattleboro, but Tom is actually coming in from LA right now. So we are all in different locations. I'm coming in live from Brooklyn. We have Brattleboro and we have LA out here. Oh, and there's Peter also in Brattleboro. Um, so we're super excited. Um, honestly, I'm just gonna go ahead and let Tom take over because he's the expert here and this is what we came for. Wonderful, thank you, Jen and Lissa. And, and thank you all for the opportunity to chat with you about regenerative agriculture in the climate crisis, uh, COVID saturated period in which we are now existing. It's tough enough to be grappling with a broken carbon and water cycle and the collapse of food production while also contending with existential climate change, but now we have this pandemic to deal with. And the thing is that they're all in some way related. And this talk today will examine that linkage. And of course, we're also in the midst of a great cultural, political reckoning with the racial injustices that saturate our history. And I honor those protests that are now occurring around the world and right around me, and hope that in our reimagination of the global food system, we can begin to also address the terrible food injustices that are in their way another plague born of industrial agriculture. Uh, in my one hour talk today, which will be a mix of story and science, I'll be excited to share with you my conjecture how regenerative agriculture might be just what the world needs to keep future pandemics from happening. But first, let's talk about being a farmer. I mean, I'm kind of a farmer these days. Uh, I did work for uh, a wonderful length of time in, in Brattleboro with New Chapter. And since then, I've gone on to much work uh, of a joyous uh, nature with uh, Greenpeace and the Carbon Underground. And, but I, I love farmers. I know some of you. Uh, in this uh, presentation in the audience are farmers. Others are thinking about becoming farmers and to become more resilient and food independent. And we all rely on farming. But was the invention of farming a good idea? And my need to make sure this advances. So it's not advancing. And why is that? It was working so well before. Are you seeing it now? Yep, it just moved ahead a slide. Yep. So you want to be Good, a farmer? You. So you want to be a farmer. Some wise observers believe that farming might just have been, in the words of Jared Diamond, the greatest blunder in the history of the human experience. Many climate activists now posit that our modern food system is the number one cause of the climate crisis. And yesterday you heard Frankie mention that the contribution of current uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gases from farming was about 29% of the total current annual contributions. And whether it's 29% or from the NGO grain, the range that they described was between uh, 47 to 53 percent. It's simply enough to acknowledge that it's significant. But in 1994, we at Finca Luna Nueva in Costa Rica had hopes of creating an ideal organic ginger and turmeric farm in Costa Rica. 
And it's been a joy every step and stumble along the way. And this is a photo of Stephen Farrell, who is the founder of Finca Luna Nueva, the founder of our farm. And he's been farming organically for around 50 years. So we always intended to be organic. We started off as organic under the United States uh, National Organic Program but we soon decided that that was not enough. We took the, the metaphysical leap into Rudolf Steiner and biodynamics. We farmed the lunar cycle. We man buried manure and cow horns. And you can see that here with Carlos Arias, our, our very first farming uh, colleague, uh, uh, overlooking those uh, uh, geometrically uh, arrayed cow horns. We mix crystals with rainwater stirred by hand to create vortices of chaos and, and, and order. And we buried herbs and sheep bladders and we did it all. And, and it was our hope that we would mystically convert what wants to be this. And the picture you're seeing here, this is a view from my farm to the Arenal volcano 13 miles away over the children's eternal rainforest on the Caribbean slope of the Central American rainforest where we get at 10 degrees north of the equator between four to five meters of rain a year with rich volcanic soil. In other words, it's a growing paradise, but anything, any land where we are wants to be rainforest. But we resolved as farmers that we wanted to mystically, biodynamically convert that into this. And it was, it's beautiful. This was our farm in its earliest years. And you can see we're right there at the edge of the, of the secondary rainforest. And we did it. And I know my daughter is uh, in the audience. There you are, Sarah, with uh, our, my granddaughter, Sarah's daughter, Eloise, milking one of our cows at the farm. And we did it with consciousness uh, and special love from Sarah and Eloise. Uh, the farmers working with this have been with us for over 25 years. We've never once strayed from the organic path. We used oxen and, and water buffalo, and you're seeing a water buffalo there, uh, pull our plows. We had pigs do a final pass through the field to clear and turn and fertilize. And after every harvest of ginger or turmeric, the fields had years, four to five years of fallow, where it would begin to transition back to secondary rainforest. And 60% of our land was either primary or secondary rainforest, and the turmeric was spectacular. It grew so vigorously, so tall. You could lose yourself in amazement, in the maze of the turmeric. And this is little Mateo. This is about 10 years ago with his dad, Ishmael, walking through our turmeric field. And our yields were exceptional. And the quality of the turmeric, we were told, was the best in the world. And this is Walter Arias, Carlos's brother, Again, one of our farmers has been with us for almost 25 years. And we planted everything in rows, linear, orderly, straight, non-random, monoculture, like nothing in a rainforest ever grows. And as a result, and perhaps inevitably, I would argue, Fusarium, a fungal root disease happened. The fusarium was on the attack. It threatened our harvest. Uh, we were facing commercial ruin. So we contacted the then head of Demeter USA, the, the umbrella organization for biodynamics, and his name was Jim Fulmer, and we were frantically seeking a quick fix. What biodynamic preps, we asked Jim, should we apply? What could we do to save our harvest? And Jim responded, why are you asking me? And we said, Jim, you're our biodynamic guide, our certifier. You hopefully will have some quick answers. And he declined to give us a recommendation. 
reminding us instead that in biodynamics, our farm was a living wholeness. And therefore, go out, he said, and listen to the farm. The farm will tell us what to do. So Stephen and Carlos went out to the fields. They sat down, they listened, and this is a little or a lot metaphysical, but they thought that they actually heard the farm say, plant us in mounds, not in rows. See, the rows that we were using, the monocultural linear, non-random rows, were like electric cables conducting the fusarium pathogen and infecting every plant. But once we planted in mounds, and this was 2.0 at the farm, we broke that connection and the fusarium problem got a little better. And while we were exploring new geometries of biodynamic farming in Costa Rica, Sarah and I were up at the Rodale Institute learning about regenerative agriculture from Dr. Tim LaSalle, then the CEO of the Rodale Institute. And this is a fairly recent picture of Tim taken at our farm, Luna Nueva. And with Sarah on the right, you can see at the Rodale farming test site, organic corn is on the right of that picture, conventional chemical is on the left. It was during the drought year, and you could see the profound uh, growing advantage uh, 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 afforded to the organically managed corn. And this all began a collaboration with Rodale, which led to the writing of the now uh, quite influential and famous Rodale White Paper on regenerative agriculture. It led to our collaborating with Rodale on a tropical farming systems trial in Costa Rica, where we began to investigate the ecological and, and economic value of regenerative agriculture in the humid tropics. And here is the white paper itself. And from the white paper, I excerpted from the executive summary, there are important fresh looks, such as the new tropical farming system trial on the Caribbean slope of Costa Rica, the TFST is exactly the type of research needed for us to understand the full sequestration potential of regenerative agriculture. And Raildale Institute is pleased to be collaborating with local researchers associated with Finca Luna Nueva and Earth University. And so with that, we launched our trial in early February, about seven years ago, at a farm site near our farm in Costa Rica. We couldn't do it at our farm because we were going to be comparing biodynamic, organic, all regenerative in that rubric, as you'll understand it, compared to chemical agriculture. We couldn't spray chemicals at our farm. So we worked with the neighbor who was happy to collaborate us. We set up plots that were managed regeneratively. And then right after we planted our test plots, a six week drought happened. No one alive had ever experienced such a drought on the Caribbean slope of the Costa Rican rainforest. Unimaginable, people said. It was a black swan weather event. Funny, but maybe not so funny that never in a lifetime black swan weather, weather event has happened twice since then. But, but seven years ago, I went out to the site during that drought with my camera and I took two photos. First, the chemically managed cassava field, yucca, cassava, a principal starch uh, for much of the tropics around the world. And th that's my elbow. You can see it on the left-hand, lower left-hand side of the screen. And I then pivoted and took the organic cassava field. This is organic chemical, organic. 
And we then did what was perhaps unnecessary because our eyes were not deceiving us. We did a statistical analysis of life and death of, of how the cassava cuttings, because it's propagatively grown, how they fared, and it was life and death. It was 93% successful growth in the organic plots versus total failure, lifelessness in the chemical. And we didn't understand why, because this was year one of the trial. And our baseline soil data confirmed that there were no meaningful differences in soil organic matter or any other chemical or structural soil indicator. The same starting soil, the same farmers, the same cassava cuttings, the same sunlight, the same rainfall. In fact, at this early stage of the trial, the same exact planting pattern, but life or death. Why? What explains the statistically significant differences? It turns out there were statistically significant differences below ground, invisible from the surface of microbial populations, bacteria and protozoans between the organic and chemical fields. In every case, the microbial dynamics in the chemical fields were materially impaired. So at the same time we did this at the farming trial site, we decided to go to our farm, Luna Nueva. So back at the farm, we did soil testing. And then, It happened. The epiphany. Based on our new understanding of regenerative agriculture, we knew we should be seeing improvements in soil organic matter year after year. But when we tested our farm, the area that the humans were managing, our fields, we came in third, the worst soil organic matter levels. The areas that the cows were managing, our pastures, they came in second place. And the borders being managed by mother nature, the humans and cows were ignoring, won first prize for the highest soil organic matter levels. Now we thought we were regenerative bosses. We were patting ourselves on the back with all the organic and biodynamic coddling that we were doing. Boy, the results were humbling. It was time for us to do some soil searching. We had focused on perfecting the organic and biodynamic practices. We assumed that that was enough, but the numbers don't lie. We were forced by the data to consider more deeply the meaning of regenerative agriculture. And we had lots of help from wise and experienced agronomists and soil scientists. Two are mentioned, are shown here, uh, discussed on this slide. And I'll share some key insights. First with Dr. Chris Nichols, who's pictured, uh, a famous soil microbiologist. And I, I met with her up at the Rodale Institute where she was then chief scientist. And I had this theory that nematodes and soil fungi have this ballet where one controlled the other. And Chris basically said, whoa, whoa, take it easy, Tom. The soil food web is way too complicated for the human brain to comprehend with precision. We need to simply stay humble and bow down to that infinite complexity. And she also explained that soil organic matter comes not from the decomposition of organic matter, which is what everyone knows or assumes, but it actually comes from the activity of the soil food web. And that's a segue to the, the deep teachings of Dr. Christine Jones, the, the author of the concept of the liquid carbon pathway. She explained that, that soil organic matter is all about the composition forces via the liquid carbon pathway outracing the decomposition forces that want to consume organic matter in the soil. 
So let's look at that complicated thought, try and simplify it a bit. This is a highly simplified diagram of the soil food web. And note that what Christine Jones describes as, the, as liquid carbon, it, it flows via photosynthesis that the plant uh, is utilizing through the, the chloroplasts in their above ground leafy matter, capturing uh, solar energy, uh, combining that solar energy with atoms from deconstructed water and CO2 molecules, recombining with solar energy into plant sugars and then passing those plant sugars through their roots into the soil. And that liquid carbon, that sugary sunlight, I've depicted as a cookie here on the slide. That's the liquid carbon in the soil pouring through the roots. And the liquid carbon then, then passes through the roots and is utilized by fungi, by bacteria, and by the whole soil food web. But why? Why would the plant share its, its uh, liquid carbon that it manufactured photosynthetically to satisfy its metabolic needs? Why would a plant share? Why the generosity? It turns out that it's an economic transaction. Because whereas plants can speak carbon dioxide, they have that linguistic ability to speak carbon. They weirdly can't speak nitrogen. And even though plants are surrounded, as we all are, by 78% nitrogen in the atmosphere, they, plants can't access it. But, but bacteria can speak nitrogen. And fungi can transport nutrients that bacteria fix or solubilize. But bacteria and plants can't speak carbon and they need those sugars. They'll work for sugar. We all work for carbohydrates. Our metabolic needs, all of life's metabolic needs require those complex carbon molecules. And so there is an underground barter system where the soil food web trades biologically available minerals with the plant in exchange for those cookies. And then the myriad infinitely complex bacteria and fungi and protists and nematodes and worms and insects, they engage in their ballet of eating and excreting and dying. And all of this is happening at the root tip, at the rhizosphere, where biology meets geology. And we now know from recent peer-reviewed science that plant diversity with lots of different sizes and shapes of roots leads to, and I'll quote from the paper, significantly increased shoot biomass, root biomass, the amount of root exudates, bacterial biomass, and fungal biomass. This is the main lesson about the regenerating of soil organic matter. Let's drill this in. Plant diversity above ground leads to more underground biomass. And biomass is the storage system for carbon. So let's keep that in mind. Plant diversity leads to more underground biomass. I want to elaborate on that main lesson. And uh, Sarah, I'm making believe that this is a picture of me at uh, about the age of two, because I was told by my family, this is family legend, that my very first sentence as a toddler, or my very first complex thought as a toddler that I vocalized was dead bug. I looked down at the pavement and said, dead bug. And it turns out that dead bugs are necromass, comprise more than 50% of all soil organic carbon. Dr. Christine Jones poetically describes the necromass 
as the glues and gums of the soil food web. So whether you call it dead bug or necromass or glues and gums, it's the same concept. Let's now drill more deeply. Here's how it works. Remember that there were these liquid carbon cookies, the root exudates, and that's in the middle at the bottom of the screen here. That's, the, that's what the plants manufacture. And they then, as we've described in that underground barter, are feeding bacteria and fungi and other creatures in the soil food web. And those creatures eat, get eaten, excrete, die, create necromass, dead bugs. And those then form bundles of carbon-rich, highly delicious, irresistibly delicious cookies all through the soil. And those sugars are prepackaged solar energy and everyone wants to eat that solar energy. And those cookies will either get eaten quickly, fast food, or they find a place to hide, safely tucked away from the hungry infinity of microorganisms. If they find that hiding place, they can bind with soil particles and start forming microaggregates, the building blocks of stable soil organic matter. Simply having more dead bugs, more necromass, doesn't necessarily translate to stable carbon in the soil. The necromass has to go somewhere where it won't get eaten by decomposing microorganisms. Remember what Dr. Christine Jones says, the composers have to outrun the decomposers. And in my world down in the hot and humid tropics, that is a real challenge. Or as a parent or grandparent now, I could ask, how do you keep the kid away from the cookies in the soil? And that led to my big 2019 revelation, informed by key research from Michigan State University. You have to hide the cookies in nooks and crannies so tiny that not even the little kids with teensy weensy fingers can reach in and get them. This research from Michigan State University first explained that soil organic matter does not come primarily from the decomposition of leaf litter or organic debris. Remember that Chris Nichols said that maybe only 1% or less comes from the decomposition pathway. We need that, we need that fast food. It, it, it pump starts, it jump starts the, the soil food web, but the over major, overwhelming majority of soil organic matter comes from necromass incorporated into microaggregates with minerals that then find refuge in a soil pore where the decomposers can't get to it. The cookies find their way into a cookie jar. And the research from Michigan State, and this is so critical, I'm gonna read this so that everyone can, can follow along and, and this is a main point. Plant roots are the key agents in the formation of soil pore architecture. Pores in the 30 to 150 micron size range are the preferential location of new carbon inputs and active microbial communities where the active processing of carbon inputs takes place. The greater the volume of the soil matrix in contact with such pores, the greater the potential for microbial decomposition products to be transported to and protected within the soil matrix inaccessible to the microbial decomposers. In other words, more cookie jars. Plant systems that stimulate the creation of those cookie jars enhance the opportunities for microbial decomposition products to reach inaccessible soil matrix and stimulate 
carbon gains. So here's a decomposing microorganism, our friendly Pac-Man creature. Here are the cookies in the soil. And you know, if they're not in a pore, a tiny pore where they're protected, we know what's gonna happen. The decomposers, and what happens next is perhaps indelicate, but well, that's what's happening. It turns out that the respiration of soil microbes off-gassing is the silent but deadly way that much of our excess CO2 ended up in the atmosphere. But Michigan State explains, if you've got lots of places to hide the cookies, that those differences in root architecture born of biological diversity will create the pores in sufficient number that you have places to hide the cookies and you will have stable soil carbon form. So now let's take a look where you've got above ground biodiversity, lots of different pores, lots of different cookie jars being formed. And the decomposing microorganisms, they can't get at it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how soil organic matter is formed in the soil. And the sum and substance of all of this is if you want healthy soil, you have to have above ground plant diversity. And plant diversity will look different in different ecosystems. On the far left, you have a tropical ecosystem. In the upper right, that's actually a picture in the, uh, the Northern Great Plains uh, up in Minnesota of my buddy, uh, Reginaldo Haslett Marroquin's tree range poultry system which depends on plant diversity and hazelnuts and elderberry and nettle and mulberry. Yes, even with poultry production, you can have plant diversity that is vigorous in different ecosystems. So let's look at this in different ecosystems. I visited the grazing site managed by the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems at Cal State Chico. And the plant diversity there, the forbs, the grasses, and the herbs uh, in the pasture, it created rich soil and a haven for earthworms. And I went there with Cindy Daly, who's sent in the center of the upper left, and we looked in the holistically managed pastures, and there were earthworms everywhere, but then we crossed a, a very narrow gravel road to the chemically conventionally uh, not holistically man managed pasture, and it was dead soil. There were no earthworms. And I want to thank Cindy Daly and Dr. Tim LaSalle, who's now with Cindy uh, at the Regenerative Agriculture uh, Center at Chico State. It's a remarkable uh, academic institution that I commend to all of you. Again, looking at grasslands. This peer-reviewed research shows that the greater species richness, the greater biodiversity above ground, you will have greater carbon storage and therefore economic value below ground. Above ground biodiversity leads to below ground economic value soil richness. And this is true everywhere around the world. The book by Eric Tensmeyer, The Carbon Farming Solution, looks at home gardens in the tropics, looks at, at, at tropical farming systems around the world. And in the appendix, he, he examines in peer, with peer-reviewed research studies all around the world with different crops. One of them in Costa Rica uh, by Dr. Nair looks at a multi-strata, different tiers achieved through polyculture plant diversity with cacao, with chocolate plantation. And in that polyculture multi-strata agroecological farming system, more than 40 tons 
of carbon were sequestered per hectare per year. And we know that smallholder farms produce most of the world's food. There are 500 plus million smallholder farms in the world, two plus billion smallholder farmers, the majority being women. And Roland Bunch explains in this uh, indispensable reference, Restoring the Soil, that one way to create above ground biodiversity is by using green manure and cover crops to augment diversity in an economically available way for smallholder farmers. And he imagines in this book with us a different world, quote, if this were done on all of the 225 million hectares that smallholders are calculated to have around 12% of the world's agricultural land, the total carbon sequestered would be close to 85 gigatons or just over 10.5% of the 810 gigatons of carbon, the entire world will need to sequester by 2100 to reach the goals of the Paris Accords. If, Roland Bunch asks, if the world's largest scale farmers could sequester similar levels of carbon, then the world's farmers would be sequestering a large majority of the carbon needed to reach those goals. And if ranchers grazing cattle on pastures did it, they should be able to double that level of carbon sequestration. So you may be wondering, who is this Roland Bunch guy? And he is someone that we need to listen to. He is one of the world's most well-respected leaders in regenerative land management. He has consulted for over 40 NGOs, governments in 50 nations, Cornell University, the Ford Foundation, Oxfam, Save the Children. So I reached out to Roland to prepare me to give you this presentation. And I asked him if he had thoughts about the relationship of biodiversity and carbon matter in the soil. And this was his email to me on May the 6th. The golden rule, he writes, with respect to the management of green manure cover crops, is that one should imitate the forest, gradually coming as close to a forest as we can without closing the minimum number of spaces we need to produce very good crops. That is, he continues, we can have trees that produce dispersed shade, bushes or vines that grow beside the crops, crawling species that grow under them to create uh, in dry season, uh, optimal above ground carbon. Our goal is to imitate the biodiversity, the maximum biomass production and the soil cover that a forest enjoys. And in that way, he writes, we will also achieve the high level of biomass productivity, the lack of a need to plow the soil, the millennial long maintenance of soil fertility, the almost total resistance to droughts, and the lack of major damage from insect pests that tropical forests enjoy. In a subsequent email, he writes to me, I am struck with how often our crops, especially in the tropics, are seriously threatened by one disease or insect after another. Yet tropical forests have existed and maintained their incredible biodiversity for millions of years without a single application of pesticides. Obviously, their biodiversity has something to do with it. I've recently taken to asking villagers if they have ever noticed a plant out in the mostly untouched forest that has been lost or almost lost because of an insect pest disease or herbivorous animal. And even the women who know the forest the best, when I ask those who know it the best, the women have never been able to describe even a single species that met that fate. It's the biodiversity itself that protects the forest from predation. 
Roll that term around in your mind, biodiversity, it's the key. And I asked Dr. David Johnson and Hui Chun Su of Chico State and New Mexico State Universities. I asked them again in preparation for my talk today about diversity. And Dr. Johnson in an email to me said, quote, diversity is the currency of survival on this planet. And Hui Chan and David have created what they call beam composting, which uh, creates a fungally dominated compost that can be applied as an inoculant. And we've studied beam composting with David and Hui Chan. And here's a picture at our farm uh, with Tim LaSalle and, and Cindy Daly and the farmers, some of whom you've seen earlier. And we, we've, we're applying it, we're studying it. And I'm not suggesting to you that beam as described very uh, brilliantly by David and Hui Chung and elaborated at Chico State's uh, uh, clearinghouse of information. I'm not saying it's the only way to introduce these uh, biologically diverse soil inoculants, but it's a brilliant way. It's an, it's an exciting way. It's one that we need to explore and to embrace. So based on the failures, the epiphanies, the evolving research, it led us back to the future at our farm. Remember how we used to farm in rows and then we farmed in monoculture mounds? Well, the back to the future revelation was to farm more like what Roland Bunt said in harmony with the desires of our ecosystem with as much microbial and above ground biodiversity as possible. Now the photo above is a more mature area at our farm, which some years ago we transitioned to agroforestry. And that's Stephen Farrell, the founder under a nutmeg maize tree with dozens of productive trees and vines around it, helping us grow food more like a forest. But let's take a drone's eye view now and how our old fields that were rows and then mounds, and how our old fields are starting to look as we prepare them to become our new agroecological cacao fields. I, I was expecting to have been in Costa Rica, but because of, of being sheltered in place in Los Angeles, I had one of our farm colleagues uh, Scott Gallant of Porvenir Design uh, do some drone footage a few weeks ago. And here is what our fields are looking like right now as we are preparing them to receive several hundred new cacao trees. And in a square meter, we have in some areas of our farm uh, a dozen, two dozen different crops in, in each square meter of the field. And there will be, at, as this matures, many layers, multi-strata, polycultures, where we are growing food like a forest. And based on our experience at Luna Nueva, based on the emerging science, the agronomic experience, and our international collaborations, we began to memorialize what it means to be regenerative. We had 22 nations in this picture gather at Finkelo Nueva to celebrate the regenerative revolution. And then in, in early 2017, Chico State and the Carbon Underground began to create this, this working, evolving definition of regenerative agriculture. And the preamble states that regenerative agriculture describes farming and grazing practices that among other benefits, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. And what's really important here is you can see how in this preamble and throughout this, this definition, we focused on outcomes not practices. I mean, at our farm, we're still 100% organic. We still embrace 
some biodynamic practices. But at Luna Nueva, as in this definition, our focus is not simply on practice or regulatory orthodoxy, but on seeing real ecological changes year after year. This working definition basically leaves it up to farmers around the world to decide on the practices that work best with their crops in their growing zone as long as the ecologically beneficial outcomes are achieved. And although it was drafted by the Carbon Underground and by Chico State with the support of, of more than 150 agronomists, scientific and lay contributions, this working definition some years ago was co-signed by, by several hundred NGOs, scientists, uh, and corporations around the world in the beginnings of the formation of a consensus as to what it means to be regenerative. And from that, there was a, a natural segue to the creation of the Soil Carbon Initiative to take that definition and to make it operational. And we created a, a, a standard. We've subjected it to expert and general public comment. Uh, the design team uh, was the Carbon Underground, Green America, Megafood, Ben & Jerry's, and Danone White Wave. And the standard is now being tested in pilot farms around the world. And in fact, the standard has itself has been uh, embraced by the government of Thailand. So we've come a long way from our beginnings. But I think I know what everyone is thinking right now, what's wondering right now. Will regenerative agriculture end the COVID-19 nightmare, right? It's on everyone's, everyone's mind. Remember today's theme, biological diversity. It turns out that there is a disease diversity association that is well understood. We impoverish the ecosystem at our own peril. In this March 2020 article, there was an interview with Dr. Felicia Kiesing, where she explains that as biodiversity disappears, the risk to hum human health increases. All over the world, she writes, there are fewer and fewer of most kinds of wild creatures and more and more domesticated creatures and humans. We're losing wild species, but we're doing it at the expense of increases in a very small number of species. Those domesticated species tend to be less diverse. We're growing a lot of the same crops worldwide and raising a lot of the same animals, which makes for easier targets for pathogens. It's easier for them to move around. I also recommend the writings of Dr. Rob Wallace. And in his book, Big Farms Make Big Flu, he frames the case for biodiversity in a way that I find absolutely appealing. Deforestation intensive agriculture, he writes, may strip out traditional agroforestry stochastic friction, which typically keeps the virus from lining up enough transmission. Don't you love that term, stochastic friction? Stochastic means random. Let's explore, explore what he means by stochastic friction on the assumption that everything we've ever needed to know we learned in kindergarten. Well, let's look at a kindergarten hopscotch game. And here's the stochastic hopscotch game, filled with challenges in every form and dimension. Enter the coronavirus. And note that before it can get through and infect you, it's got to run the gauntlet. Uh, the stochastic friction represented by a biologically diverse ecosystem 
block the virus from infecting humans. But what if we strip out the stochastic friction? What if we dummy down the ecosystem? What if, like at Luna, we planted just one crop in a row of monoculture? And here's how that experiment turns out. Enter the virus. Nothing stops it. There's no stochastic friction. But wait, isn't all that biodiversity out there bad for us? Isn't that where those pathogens are lurking? Are we supposed to be happy about all the animals and bugs and microorganisms and pathogens in the forest dark and deep? Scary fairy tales taught us to be afraid. But it turns out that the forest deep is actually our best friend. There's now substantial evidence, Dr. Kiesing again writes, that high diversity protects humans against the transmission of many existing diseases. And this leads to my conjecture. And the reason I'm giving this presentation to you today what might the hopscotch game look like if we produce food, as Roland Bunch implored us, like a forest produces food, like a prairie produces food, with abundant biodiversity? What if we brought back earthworms, nematodes, voles, flowers, bees, butterflies, birds, and more? What would that hopscotch game look like with stochastic friction? Let's take a look. Here's the hopscotch game. There's the bird and the bunny and the earthworm and the, the squirrel and the flower and the, the dragonfly. Enter the coronavirus. We look at this hopscotch game and it looks like fun. But for a virus that has the ability to infect only one thing or maybe two things, well, when it starts going down the stochastic board, it got past the bird and the bunny and the earthworm, but the squirrels got it. Leave it to the squirrels. But once again, I know what everyone is wondering. Is there a relationship between farming with plant diversity and overall ecosystem biodiversity? And as a general principle, plant diversity leads to animal biodiversity. And we've actually seen this in farming context. And this is the big bio experiment at the University of Minnesota. There were 168 plots of grassland species planted in 1994. And as plant diversity goes up, fung fungal diseases go down, and all insect populations go up. And Sarah, I know you're, you're uh, listening in. Remember. 10 or 12 years ago when we were in Karnataka outside of Bangalore uh, at, a, at a cooperative of organic turmeric farmers. And we were asking the lead agronomist there, well, do you ask the farmers if they're doing it right? Are you, do you ask the farmers if they're following the recommended practices? And the agronomist said, no, 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 we, we don't ask the farmers because they might not tell you the full story. Ask the insects. If the insects are there, the farmers are doing it right. And so what we're finding it, it, in peer-reviewed research and in experience around the world is that plant biodiversity drives animal biodiversity and increases disease resistance. Once again, looking at grassland management, if the insects come back, will maybe the birds return? And this was in upstate New York, where holistic management increased obligate grassland bird populations 1.5 to 4.0 times greater than minimally rotated or continuously grazed species. And that gives me hope that regenerative agriculture can bring back birds. And that maybe Silent Spring can become a sonic symphony of birdsong. And it's not just me dreaming this. Even the Audubon Society is seeing this. Here's a very uh, short 
uh, excerpt from a film from the Audubon Society in New Mexico, which illustrates this point. Healthy grasslands are diversity of grass, uh, diversity of, of wildlife, insect communities. This place is absolutely a, a great example of that. And, and that place was a ranch, a holistically managed ranch. In, in a, a additional ranch research, this from Dr. Richard Teague at Texas A&M University, looking at ranches in, in contiguous counties in Texas where regenerative AMP grazing, adaptive multi-paddock grazing has been practiced in semi-arid and arid lands for some time, plant productivity and biodiversity have increased. This has resulted in the re-perennialization of ephemeral streams and watershed functions. Pollinators have increased. So we're all about saving the worms. And let's, let's consider this study comparing the, the ecological vitality of 18 conventional versus seven holistic dual purchase ranches in Mexico. And it found that the ranches managed holistically had greater yields, deeper topsoil, and increased earthworm presence. Holistic management strategies are leading to, quote, greater ecological and economic sustainability. I want to thank Bobby Gill and the whole Savory Institute team, not only for giving me this study to report on to you, but also for all the work that they're doing at the Savory Institute um, to regenerate uh, millions of hectares around the world. Another wonderful story, Dr. Alan Williams bought degraded land in the Mississippi Delta it was a cotton plantation for 150 years. Then it was uh, overgrazed with cattle. Then it became a hunting lodge. And the hunting lodge decided to give it away for pennies because there were no animals to kill. So they sold it at a depressed value to Dr. Alan Williams. And Alan came in, he managed it with adaptive multi-paddock grazing. And a few years later, all the wildlife came back. And guess what? The hunting lodge is now trying to buy it back from him. In Africa, more milk and double the wildlife in areas that are holistically managed in Kenya. So this is a win-win for the farmer, a win-win for nature. And we in the Carbon Underground ask, well, what if every farmer and rancher worldwide operated as if their land was one giant insect hotel. And it's a big what if. And we don't know. But the world is rooting for us to try. Let's consider what some agronomists have seen in their research around the world. David Johnson and Hui Chun Tzu at New Mexico State in row crop agriculture, 11 tons of carbon sequestered per hectare per year. Christine Jones in Australia in Silva pasture, nine tons per hectare per year. Alan Williams in Mississippi using AMP grazing, nine tons per hectare per year. University of Georgia dairy operations, eight tons per hectare per year. You in Vermont with all your dairy, look at that research, follow that research. Richard Teague in Texas, three tons of carbon sequestered per hectare per year. Roland Bunch, six tons per hectare per year with green manure cover cropping systems, practiced by tens of thousands of farmers around the world. Dr. Nair in Costa Rica, 40 tons per hectare per year in cacao. Edward Mueller, 120 tons per hectare in above and below ground carbon in bamboo plantations. And remember, there are 3.5 billion hectares of grasslands and 1.5 billion hectares of arable land. Mother Nature wants her carbon back. So with three tons sequestered per year, 
are six tons, or nine tons, 11 tons, 40 tons, 120 tons of sequestration of carbon per year, with 5 billion available hectares to work with. You do the math. Actually, someone else has just done this math for us. Here's research just published from Dr. Ratan Lal, one of the most respected soil scientists in the world. And his work has guided Vice President Al Gore's journey into carbon sequestration and regenerative agriculture. You'll find his research underpinning the conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And what he writes is that the soil carbon sink capacity between 2020 and the end of the century, with the global adoption of best management practice, which creates a positive soil ecosystem carbon budget, is estimated at 178 picograms, billion tons, gigatons, of carbon for soil, 155 billion tons of carbon for above ground biomass, in the aggregate, 333 gigatons of carbon for the terrestrial biosphere with a total CO2 drawdown potential from where we are right now of 417 parts per million, drawing down using regenerative agriculture, 157 parts per million. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is the green revolution that the world needs. Some of you were at this rally in Brattleboro. That's my grandson, Elias, holding the banner on the far left. In conclusion, no one can say that we've got this, that we're completely satisfied with the research. We're not there yet. The carbon sequestration data don't yet unassailably prove the climate case, but the data are strong enough, encouraging enough, that they, they give us a path forward. They give us hope to planetary healing, to the possibility of a cooler future, to food justice, and maybe, just maybe, to more gloriously beautiful and protective stochastic friction. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Wow, Tom, incredible. Um, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, just to let our attendees know that we will, we did record it and we will have it um, available for you to rewatch. I know I'm going to need to watch that probably a few times to, to let all the information sink in. Um, I'm going to just jump right to questions if you're ready, Tom. Sure. Okay, so we've got a question from Linda Martin. Uh, it's a, she asks, will the slides of information for this amazing presentation be available for us afterwards? I couldn't write fast enough. Yes. Excellent. All right, we'll I'm, that happen. I'm also happy uh, if people want to write me or in, uh, have follow-up questions. Uh, I think all the data that I cited is freely available and not behind a, a paywall, but uh, I'll, I'll share all of the, the information. Great, excellent. So we will definitely get that to all our attendees. Um, our next question is from Monroe Whitaker. What are the primary obstacles to a regenerative approach to agriculture now? Well, it's, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna vary government by government. Uh, in the United States, I think there are, there are two primary obstacles. One is uh, stubborn, recalcitrant, obstinate uh, parents and grandparents uh, getting in the way of uh, children with a vision. And I've heard from a lot of people that, you know, gee, Tom, I, I really like what you're saying. I really want to do it. But uh, my dad or my, 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 my grandpa won't let me farm in this way. So there's a cultural uh, generational issue in the United States. 
that's not, it's not the case all around the world. And then in the United States, as a matter of, uh, as a matter of policy, things such as uh, federal crop insurance, which basically uh, force farmers to plant monoculture fence line to fence line in order to fully qualify for federal crop insurance. So there are, there are some policy impediments in the United States, generational cultural impediments. We also are confronting um, a powerful uh, economic force in the uh, industrial extractive uh, chemical model. Um, some of the most powerful uh, corporate uh, organizations in the world are uh, synthetic fertility and synthetic uh, uh, pesticide manufacturers. And they have enormous power and power leads to money and money gives you political power. So we've got some political issues. Uh, Andre Loy in uh, a submission to the United Nations in 2013 uh, said it best that the only thing that we're missing really is political will. And that's what we in the Carbon Underground and Regeneration International and Green America and Chico State and organizations around the world, all of us now are working to catalyze, mobilize, inspire political will to demand this change. And, and it's working. I mean, the government of Thailand is embracing it. So it, it, we're getting to scale and it is happening. Thank you, Tom. Next question from Rebecca Mitchell. Is the capital outlay quite high to make a complete change from monoculture of crops to diverse crop farms? So uh, the best person in the world to answer this is Roland Bunch, who has taught tens of millions of smallholder farmers who don't have the money, who don't have the capital to to, to, to fund an expensive transition. They don't have the money to apply uh, expensive, deep applications of compost. So he's taught them using green manure cover crops, very inexpensive ways to make the ecosystem do this uh, regenerative work for us. Remember, it's being done by plant biodiversity. And what we are finding around the world in, in, in different ecosystems, that this does pay for itself. Now, having said that, in the first three to four years, as you, as you transition from uh, monoculture, chemical, industrial agriculture to regenerative, you could have some yield diminution. And there, there does need to be a, a, an economic reckoning to be able to help farmers in that transition, especially in countries like the United States, in, in Western affluent countries, where the governments can afford to compensate both directly and indirectly farmers for ecosystem services. So Roland says, we don't need subsidies, we don't need help. Farmers will do this on their own because they will make more money. In the words of Gabe Brown, the great regenerative uh, farmer in the, in the Pacific Northwest, I like to sign the back of the check, not the front of the check. I like to endorse the payments to me and not make payments to others. And he doesn't want government handout. This makes him more money. He told me at a lunch a few years ago that he was facing bankruptcy as a conventional farmer. And now he's said he's basically having a waterfall of profitability because he's a regenerative farmer. So the very important question is, yes, it can cost, but it ought to pay for itself. And we still should help. Thank you so much. Our next, uh, we have a comment and question from Orly Munsing, who is the Strolling of the Heifers founder. Hi, Orly. 
Um, Orly says, hi, Tom. Thank you so much for donating your time to the Slow Living Summit and your amazing presentation. And her question is, can you explain the differences between the soil carbon approach to other regenerative agriculture approaches? Do you see any difference? I, you know, if it's regenerative, it's regenerative. Uh, there can be there can be layers. There can be uh, different uh, uh, what I would call gingerbread or filigree. But if it's but if you're increasing soil organic matter year after year, if you're increasing sto soil stability year after year, if you're increasing above ground and below ground biodiversity year after year, if the water infiltration and water management and the regenerated soil water battery is improving year after year. If those four things are there, then you're being regenerative. Now, you can also be regenerative and organic. You can be regenerative and biodynamic. You could be regenerative and uh, name it, name your flavor of, of utopia. And, and, I, and I'm still an organic farmer, and I love organic farming, and I'm always going to be an organic farmer. But you, you don't have to first be organic in order to join the regenerative revolution, in order to, to use plant biodiversity and the general overarching principles of regenerative agriculture to see those four indicia improving year after year. So from the vantage point of the soil carbon index created by the soil carbon initiative based on that definition that was created now uh, some years ago, we're looking at outcomes. We're not looking at an orthodoxy of practice. But that doesn't mean that all of us in the carbon underground and in the soil carbon initiative don't embrace and praise practitioners of regenerative agriculture who are also doing it with, with obedience to uh, organic and biodynamic principles. We salute them. Thank you. Our next question is from Holly Shimizu. I'm sorry if I butchered your name, Holly. Um, Holly asks, how do you see this applying to home gardeners? Well, hi, Holly. Holly and I are on the board of the American Bot Botanical Council uh, together. Hi, Holly. Uh, well, Eric Tensmeyer's book basically examines the, uh, the ebullient expression of productivity in home gardens, as that term is used around the tropics. Uh, home gardens in temperate zones should be regenerative. We should, in temperate zones, be managing our personal gardens like a prairie grows food. Remember Roland Bunch's admonition, uh, encouragement to us, uh, grow your food like a forest produces food, like, like your ecosystem wants to produce food. That will be the most uh, ecological and economically efficient way of doing it. So there are some basic principles. You, you don't want to unnecessarily rip apart the structure of the soil. You don't want to be plowing, digging up the soil. You want to leave the soil undisturbed. No knives through the flesh of Mother Earth, please. We don't want to be applying poisons to the soil, which would be diminishing or killing off below ground life in the soil. We don't want to be applying synthetic fertility. If we can avoid it, we want to minimize it because that distorts the natural ecological processes, the, the give and take and the soil food web. So there are certain principles that, that apply whether we're in a rainforest with home gardens or we're in the temperate zone with gardens near our house. Uh, and we want to and we want to follow the teaching that Michigan State in that 2019 pivotal paper taught us 
It all happens because of above ground biodiversity, no monoculture. By the way, green grass, the number one crop grown in the United States, the number one crop on which people apply both water and synthetic nitrogen fertility, that's called a monoculture. With very short roots, that ain't doing much to regenerate the ecosystem. Thank you for that question, Holly. Well, this is a nice follow-up to that because it's kind of related. So uh, Jeff Haverly says, here in Indiana, a hectare upon hectare of cornfields, how do we start transitioning to regenerative farming? Thoughts? So how do you transition from corn fields to regenerative? Um, you know what, I'm not quite sure. Maybe he could uh, clarify that for us. That, was that the question? I'm not sure if he's asking if we transition to different crops or if you use regenerative with. There we go, sure. uh, pull them up. <laughs> well, and while, do you have an elaboration? Yes, we are trying to unmute him right now. Um, we pulled him up into the panel so you can ask a uh, follow-up. Here we go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just see field after field and, and, and um, with all the nitrogen that's artificially put on it and I think about all the damage it runs right down into the gulf uh, and runoff and the single crop. How do we get there? How do we make the changes and what's forcing it to happen and how can citizens help? So I uh I'm gonna get my blunt uh, answer uh, is that there will be no choice. And, and it's Jeff, J Jeffrey, there, there's no choice. I mean, you saw my slide, what happened during the drought year seven years ago in Costa Rica with cassava, which is basically the tropics version of corn. It's, it's the starch of the tropics. And in the drought, there was a complete failure in the chemical conventional field and there was complete success in the field that was being transitioned to regenerative. I, I don't see that there is any other way to grow food than regenerative. When Sarah and I were in India, uh, we went to one village which was dust. The ponds had disappeared, the streams were gone, uh, the, the, literally, the, it was dust in the wind. When right up the road, 10 kilometers up the road, in, in land that was being managed, using some of the principles that I've described today, the aquifers had recharged, the rice paddies were being doubly, trebly productive, biological diversity, insects were coming back. I don't think that there is going to be any alternative but to farm in a way that, that rebuilds the soil water battery because we are going to be facing climate weather extremes, whether drought or flood, that, be, that is the new normal. And if you're gonna fight against that, if you just don't wanna, you don't wanna see it or hear it, it, it's reality. It's like what Bill McKibben said yesterday. It's reality, it's, it's biology, it's, it's physics. We've got, climate extreme, weather extreme. We've got no soil left. So we've got nothing to hold on to the water, nothing to make that rainfall efficient. We have to regenerate soil. How do you regenerate soil? Regeneratively, by using plant biodiversity and the, and the liquid carbon pathway. So I think that, I think economics and the survival of farmers will mandate the transition and then on a governmental level, let's get ahead of it. Uh, I was in Thailand uh, with Larry Kopal, the, the co-founder of the Carbon Underground with me. And we were in Thailand many times last year working with the government and, and governmental uh, agricultural leaders were, were quite frank with us. The land is dying. The, the chemical industrial model has killed much of the land in Thailand. Can you, they asked the carbon underground, help bring the soil back? And the answer is yes. And we'll do it using the general principles that I've described, but in every growing zone with every crop, 
there will be nuances and agronomists will be trained and they're being trained now at at uh, at the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and 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 Resilient Systems at Chico State. They're being trained. I just heard from Dr. Richard Teague that this is going to be happening at Texas A&M is going to be now training in regenerative agriculture all around the world. We need to get the message out and to train agronomists so that we can take these basic principles and apply them in a way that will yield the outcomes that are truly regenerative. I hope that answered your question. Thank you for that, Tom. Uh, we have another regional question from Susan Sox. She says, regenerative agriculture has to look very different in different climate zones. I have a high altitude, wet, cold hill farm in Vermont. Aside from the amount of rain, couldn't it be more different from Costa Rica? What are some resources specific to Northern New England? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, even though I worked in Brattleboro for many years, I've never farmed there. I should ask, uh, I should ask Sarah and her husband, Drew Graininger, who have a, a, a little organic farm in Putney. Uh, they might be better at, at the local resources the Rodale Institute in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania is wonderful. And uh, I've, I've, we've had this long collaboration with Rodale. Uh, I, it, it, you can uh, prompt me with that question and I can put you in contact with agronomists at different institutions around the country who might have more specific answers as to uh, who, who best in your ecosystem. Uh, Sarah, if you, you might want to unmute, but uh, uh, Tim Greiner, uh, I know is a, a wonderful consultant of regenerative agriculture who's based in the New England area, uh, working with, uh, with Ben and Jerry and others. So there are resources there and, and I'll, I'll work with you to elaborate uh, for the, the whole group. Um, actually, I, I will just add to that as well. We have a uh, financing farming panel that is on Tuesday at one o'clock, and we have two different regenerative farmers from the region that are speaking on that panel. So if you want to attend that panel, um, I think that'll be a, um, a good way to answer that question for you, Susan. Um, okay, we will move on to Nate Berry. And he says, does research indicate a level of diversity at which natural systems will achieve sustainability that include feeding us? Is the system too complex for a single diversity measurement? You know, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question because I'm not quite sure what the single diversity measurement is. Uh, it can be really simple. You could literally build a one square meter wood frame, throw it out into a field or pasture, and then get down on your knees and do a species count to the number of uh, grasses, forbs, and herbs that are represented in that, in that meter. I did that recently with the Savory Institute uh, up in our pastures at, at Luna Nueva. You can, uh, working with, uh, with people like uh, Elaine Ingham, uh, you can actually do uh, take soil samples and uh, peer at them in the microscope and speciate the microbiological diversity. So I don't know that there is one test. I'm, I'm even aware of soil sensors being created now that uh, measure the, the signals of different microbial populations. I think that's really only six months to a year away. And, and what I'm seeing, we're, we're really that close to having very inexpensive uh, below ground soil sensors detecting microbial biological diversity. I think it's the key. We've got to make it really economically uh, uh, accessible. We have to have it so that there are no barriers to being able to to study biological diversity and soil carbon uh, sequestration. But remember what the agronomist said in India when I asked, he asked the farmer, 
And the agronomist said, no, you, you ask the insects. I think that we can go out into a field and take a look at the insects. And that will be a proxy for the overall ecosystem health. Muted. Now I'm not muted anymore. <laughs> um, I'm loving how these questions too are kind of rolling into each other. Uh, Dan Hershop, uh, sorry again if I butchered your name. He asks, what, effects does, uh, what effect does the scale of enterprise have on the employment of the regenerative strategy? What effect does the, does the what again? Um, the scale of enterprise have on the employment of the regenerative stra uh, strategy. Okay, great question. So I actually think that there is a, I actually think there's an, an inverse relationship. Uh, Roland Bunch, uh, green manure cover cropping, he's taught, he's taught tens of millions of smallholders. And typically, smallholders would mean, in, as a general rule, less than two hectares, less than five acres, which is where the majority of food for, for humans is actually grown in the world. It, it may only really represent 12% of the, of the footprint of arable acreage worldwide, but it's 70% of the food for humans would be grown on that 12%. And, and it's a lot easier for a smallholder to make that transition. They're not as, they're not as, uh, uh, they don't have the sunk costs, the, the commitment to the, uh, the chemical model. They don't have the, perhaps the, the cultural impediments. Uh, many small, smallholders have a cultural memory of how uh, mother or grandmother our great grandparents farmed. Uh, in in uh, Jen, you you mentioned yesterday that you are indigenous, and uh, in uh, there in 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 Vermont, uh, I would imagine there are people in the Abenaki uh, community that still remember uh, the ways of yesteryear, where where you grew food more like a prairie. And uh, Will Rapp uh, up in, in uh, Burlington and the Intervale Center uh, would be a really good resource for, for how uh, historically in, in your region uh, people were regeneratively farming. I think that if you're a really big, huge uh, 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 farm in particular, it's more difficult to convert than if you're a smallholder. Uh, and I don't really even think we need to have the big giant farmers in the United States convert to achieve the beneficial climate effects that I spoke about in the presentation. Um, I'd like to see them convert, but uh, they may well be the very last to jump on board. Thank you for that. Um, I do want to acknowledge that Jeff Haverly does have a follow-up question, but I'm going to skip him just to get to the other folks um, right now, but it seems like he wants to continue a conversation, so that's, that's great. Uh, Maureen Kestenbaum writes, related to the question on gardening, have there been any studies of the potential impact on regenerative agriculture and urban farming? I'm wondering if it can be, if it can have a uh, multiplicative and <laughs> positive impact uh, combined with other sustainable more conventional practices on the ecology and air quality of the urban areas in which it is practiced? I'm not aware of any studies looking at the, uh, the, the carbon sequestration uh, effects uh, in, in home gardens. I will say this though, in both World War I and in World War II, uh, in the United States, we had this uh, beautiful concept called victory gardens. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the victory gardens? And, and that was, we needed to grow food in our, in our backyard, uh, in our neighborhoods, with it, with, in our community, because we, we needed to be able to uh, free up resources to support uh, the troops overseas. And so we went to victory gardening, and, and Eleanor Roosevelt from the White House would 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 uh, 
uh, and with passion talk about victory gardening. I think this is today's victory gardening. Regenerative home gardening is today's victory gardening. And back in World War II, we were growing 40% of the produce to support US citizens were grown in backyards. That's an enormous scale. So if the number one crop in the United States today is the front lawn, let's make that, let's turn that front lawn into a, a regenerating machine of ecological vitality, of biological diversity, of beauty, and of carbon sequestration. I haven't seen data on what we could achieve with that, but I bet you that the available, it'd be, it's a good follow-up question, to look up the acreage represented by all yards in the United States, I would imagine it's a staggering number, and then start doing the math. If, you, like, if you're like David and Hui Chung with their row garden, 11 tons of carbon sequestered per hectare per year, and you've got and you know you've got in your neighborhood a hectare of land well that your neighborhood is is a participant in reversing climate change and producing food security that's a really interesting question i'll follow up on that great yeah i know that um there's a park near my home in brooklyn where uh they converted the entire thing to victory gardens in the early 20th century and it's a children's farm as well so you know right. it's, it's sort of coming back here a little bit in brooklyn so it's really interesting to see um, we have Josh Traeger asking, if regenerative agriculture can help reverse the negative effects of climate change, are there companies that we can help support or invest in? Yeah, there are. Uh, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a really great question. There, there are companies that are, that are created to, um, to trade the ecological benefits generated by regenerative agriculture. So on that kind of meta level, uh, people can invest in companies that are <clears throat> support payments to farmers for uh, ecosystem services. And there are also companies that are being created that are regeneratively uh, 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 sourcing either uh, on their own land or through a supply chain materials for their products. Uh, we, uh, and the Soil Carbon uh, uh, Initiative, uh, anticipate that there will be, uh, within a fairly short period of time, some way in which consumers will have uh, an ability to find out who those companies are that are supporting a regenerative revolution. And uh, so I would expect that you will start to see on the label of products indications that companies are uh, sourcing in accordance with the soil carbon index or other uh, 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 indices or measures or standards of regenerative agriculture. So that that is happening. Awesome. Um, I will say that we're out of time right now and we have to jump on another <laughs> presentation right now. Hope that everyone here will join us for that one as well. I did put the Carbon Underground website um, up on the chat right now. And of course, um, everyone's welcome to get a hold of us uh, to get more information or if you um, lose it, forget it, whatever the, the case may be. So um, I'm going to thank you so much, Tom. This was such a wonderful talk. It, you know, if it was exciting for me as a non-scientist, and <laughs> I think that it was really exciting for the people um, who have a little bit more, more of a knowledge base around it. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, giving me this forum to present the regenerative opportunity. Absolutely. Agreed. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you to our sponsors, Breakthrough Beverage and Meadows Bee Farm. And we hope all of our participants will come back to listen to our next speaker, who is Sandra Steingraber. So thank you, Tom. And we'll see thank you soon. You. <laughs>